All right, guys, we are back. Sorry, I had to cut into that video. I um, don't know if you were enjoying it, but you're not get to enjoy it anymore because I actually have Richard right here. Um, I've known this guy for a fair bit of time as well. And quite honestly, whatever he does, I do. Um, he buys that scope, I buy that <laughs> scope. He buys this camera, I buy that camera. And hopefully you're gonna do the same thing because you're gonna be talking about the EOS R and the RA. So take it away. Hey, thanks, Simon. Um, so, hi, I'm Richard Wright, uh, obviously, and I've been doing astrophotography for a couple of decades now. I sort of blur the line between amateur and professional uh, astronomer because I'm, I, I make my living. I'm a software engineer, and historically, my specialty has been computer graphics, so I like pretty pictures on the computer to begin with uh, from a uh, computer science point of view. Uh, obviously, uh, photography, uh, digital photography, is a is a really great um, you know play in with that. And uh, for the last uh, you know almost twenty years, I've been working uh, for Software Bisque as a software engineer on the Sky and their imaging uh, software. And my my specialty is computer graphics, but also I'm their uh, imaging evangelist. Uh, so I figured out at, at some point in my career that if I volunteered to write camera plugins, it meant that I got cameras to play with. And um, that was a really good uh, career choice for me because I really, I really enjoy camera technology um, and, and playing, playing with cameras. Uh, I also write a, um, a blog for Sky and Telescope, a monthly blog called uh, Imaging Foundations with Richard Wright. So if you go to skyandtelescope.org slash astrophotography, uh, that's me, where I talk about uh, the basics of astrophotography as well. So, oh, hang on, let me, there we, whoops, there we go. So, um, why do astrophotography with uh, with the DSLR? So, coming into this, I'm not going to spend the whole, you know, a whole hour just talking about the RA and, you know, versus the R. There's, there, there's a lot of great things about the R series, and then there's a little extra icing on the cake with the RA. So, I'm going to get to that. But first, I, I figure a lot of people who are watching this, they're either uh, interested in getting into astrophotography with the DSLR, uh, either because they, they don't have any photography experience at all, or maybe they're, they do deep sky with a telescope and CCD, and they're thinking, well, maybe you know this DSLR would be kind of fun too to do some nightscapes. So I want to talk about some of the basics of DSLR astrophotography to give you a uh, a foundation before I start talking about these features because you know what is it about these features that make these cameras uh, so great? Well, we have to we have to know a few things uh, initially. I got started in astrophotography, shooting the moon with film on my wife's uh, Canon SLR camera, uh, connected that to my telescope, and I graduated to digital when Canon introduced their first digital Rebel, which uh, I was looking it up. It's been 17 years uh, since that happened. And since then, of course, I've become a bit of a camera fanatic, um, you know, being a software developer working on camera software that, that, you know, that's kind of kind of nice. And I have a pretty enviable collection of CMOS and uh, CCD cameras, um, you know, at my disposal. But if a guy in a weird uniform showed up at my door with a gun and said, you can only have one, you can only have one camera, all these cameras have got to go. Um, after I spent a lot of time crying, I would go, well, if I can only have one, it's going to be my, one of my DSLRs. Hang on a second. So I put my phone in camera mode, in uh, airplane mode, but the Wi-Fi is still on and everybody's texting me to say, hey, I see you on YouTube. So there you are. So where were we? Um, oh yes. Yeah. So if I could only have one camera, it would be uh, one of my DSLRs because it is the most versatile uh, camera that you can own, whether you're after, you know, wide field glories uh, on the beach, getting uh, the, these these deep vistas with the Milky Way or shooting constellations, or if you're going to put your telescope, uh, your camera on the back of a telescope and, and, and delve into uh, deep space mysteries and you want to get these really, um, you know, faint objects. But you can also uh, just grab your favorite Canon lens and go off to the beach and shoot the seals or, uh, you know, shoot sporting events with your kids in it. It's just simply the most uh, versatile camera you can own because it really is up to the challenges, not only of your daytime uh, photographic uh, pursuits, but it also works really great for, uh, for nightscapes as well as deep sky work. 
uh, with a telescope, uh, no matter what kind of, of astrophotography you're into, a DSLR can, can, can do that for you. In terms of quality, uh, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of noise right now uh, going on about the transition from, CMOS, uh, from CCD to CMOS in the, in the astronomical camera industry. And, you know, really the best quality CMOS camera on the market is a DSLR. It's not, uh, it's not a fluke that they cost more than, you know, some of the lower cost CMOS cameras for uh, astrophotography. There's a huge amount of research and development uh, that has gone into making these cameras. And I, and I do mean that this really is the best, um, the highest quality. You know, for example, we talk about how uh, CMOS is catching up with uh, CCD. And one of the things that um, a recent uh, a victory for CMOS has been um, AmpGlow. AmpGlow is, is starting to disappear in some of the newer CMOS cameras, finally, because it's been a real you know, pain in the neck. But I remember AmpGlow on my uh, Digital Rebel uh, you know, almost 20 years ago. And um, yeah, I haven't seen AmpGlow in a Canon uh, DSLR in over 10 years. So you know, these, the DSLRs are way ahead of the curve uh, when it comes to how to build uh, a quality camera. And, uh, you know, today's DSLRs are, are extremely good choices for um, no matter what kind of photography uh, it is that you're, you're interested in. So some things you need to know um, about, uh, just there's some things you need to know before we start talking about cameras, uh, especially DSLRs and their applicability to, uh, to astrophotographers. We have normal photographers uh, who are getting into deep sky stuff, and we have deep sky people who perhaps have used, uh, uh, you know, different scientific cameras, and they're they're getting used to using a DSLR. So I want to talk about uh, some of the things that everybody kind of needs to understand. First, astrophotography is low light imaging, very low light imaging. I think it's the low. It's it's one of the most challenging technical forms of photography uh, that you can get into. Uh, a 10 second exposure is considered extremely short by astrophotography uh, standards. I, I, I do like a lot of daytime photography and I, I see these things where you long exposures, where you, cat, you get the water all velvety and, and things like that. And astrophotographers see that sort of thing and they go, well, that's, that's, that's cute. Here, hold my beer. Uh, because, you know, 10 seconds is luxuriously giddy, almost uh, you're just, just completely insane that you could get a shot in only 10 seconds. Many of our, our better images are many minutes long or maybe even several hours long. And they're composed of many, many exposures uh, combined together uh, to get, the, um, to get the, the signal to noise ratio uh, where we need it to be. Uh, it does require a specialized and I would say a superior understanding of light and noise. Uh, there's a lot of rules of thumb about light and the noise and people try to extrapolate the physics from the rules of thumb and they get it wrong, uh, but the rules of thumb still work. And so you can be a very successful uh, photographer while not actually knowing what's going on underneath when you're doing daytime photography. Uh, when it comes to astrophotography, you can still be somewhat successful, but if you want really the better results, you should, you should have a better understanding of what's going on uh, under the covers. And some of the techniques are really very counterintuitive, especially when it comes to ISO. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about ISO, not a lot of time, but I'm going to talk about ISO for a little bit. Um, and, and, and some of the terms are kind of befuddling darks and lights and flat fields. What, what does all of this mean? And so a lot of very good daytime photographers come into astrophotography and their experience sometimes gets in the way of getting uh, the best results that they can. And the other, you know, it goes the other way too. Somebody who started doing deep sky astrophotography with a telescope, they get a DSLR and their first impression is, well, this thing is, is, is really hard to use and I can't get anything out of it and because they're relying on the experience that they have and it doesn't necessarily apply one-to-one uh, -one going back and forth. So, you know, one of the one of the fun differences, I guess, between the camera world and the telescope world is uh, how we refer to our optics. Everybody's always proud of their optics. You know, what camera do you have? Well, you start going down the list of, of lenses. And then if you're really into telescopes, you usually have more than one telescope as well. And, and you talk about them. And uh, when you're talking about camera lenses, you might say I have a 200 millimeter camera lens. Whenever you refer to a camera lens that way, you're talking about the focal length of the lens. So a 200 millimeter, you might also mention the F ratio, 200 millimeter F2.8, 
2.8 or F4. And the focal length is what gives you the scale of your image. A long focal length, a big number, uh, makes, the, makes things that are far away look bigger uh, when they're projected uh, onto your sensor. Uh, another pet peeve, and I won't dig too far into it, is crop sensors. The size of your sensor has nothing to do with your image scale. Uh, you're getting the same image uh, re regardless of how big your sensor is, just the sensor as small is not capturing all of that image. So when we get down to the technical and the engineering point, you know, a 200 millimeter focal length lens is always a 200 millimeter focal length uh, lens. Now, when we talk about a telescope, we also say, oh, I have a 200 millimeter telescope. But when, we, when we're talking about a telescope, we're not talking about the focal length, we're talking about the aperture. Because the primary job of a telescope is not to magnify things, it is to collect light. And the more aperture you have, the more light is going to be uh, collected. Uh, compare a telescope to a microscope. If you're looking at something in a microscope and you're magnifying it, you're spreading that light out. And when you spread that light out, it gets very dim. And the way to overcome that with a microscope is usually you shine extra light on the object. Well, if you're trying to take a picture of a faint galaxy, you can't shine extra light on the galaxy to make it show up better. Uh, the only thing you can do is either expose for a really long time or get a larger and larger aperture telescope to collect more and more of that light. So aperture is keen when it comes to astrophotography. Uh, light, as in any type of photography, is always, uh, you know, the primary thing uh, that we need to um, that we need to worry about. So some other things uh, that you need to know um, coming back and forth is a DSLR has a computer in it, uh, and this is this is very different from uh, most astro cameras. Uh, when you when you're doing astrophotography with a dedicated astronomy camera. Uh, the software connects to the camera and it controls the camera and usually the software is running on your laptop or on some sort of a, a small embedded computer or maybe even a desktop computer uh, in an observatory and the computer controls the camera 100%. A DSLR is very different. It has its own computer inside of it and the DSLR even produces its own files. I see people in astronomy, there's a, the image file format is FITS uh, usually. And the, like, so the, the camera produces FITS files. The camera doesn't produce your ZWO, your QHY, your FLI, no, no matter what, they don't produce files. Uh, the software reads the data right out of that camera and it'll save it in that raw file. Now DSLR uh, is very different. It captures the data off of the sensor and it saves it in its raw file format or perhaps a JPEG file and saves it on the, uh, on the memory card that's inside the camera. And so this is really great because it enables, uh, it, it's tremendously nice when it comes to lightweight imaging rigs. If you wanna go by boat or a plane, or you have to go on a long hike. Uh, I remember a hike in Alaska that I did that uh, I knew I had a good heart when I finished that because it didn't kill me. But I remember on that hike, I wanted to throw my phone off a cliff because my phone, I felt like I was carrying you know, a cinder block with me in my pocket. Everything you're carrying weighs so much. And so, you know, if you can bring a DSLR and it has everything you need and maybe a small tripod or a little sky tracker, it has everything you need to take some images. Because let's face it, if you want to get to dark skies, you got to get away from everybody. Uh, and so that's, that, that really is, is a significant advantage that you have this little tiny self-contained thing that you can hold in a hand that is everything you need uh, to control the camera and take the images and even store the images uh, in a format um, that you can get to. Another thing about this computer inside the camera is some processing does go on. Uh, a raw file from, a, uh, from an astronomical camera looks pretty terrible because there's been no, no work, no processing has been done to it at all. No, no white balance, none of that has been applied to it. When you get a raw file out of a DSLR, it looks pretty nice. And it always amuses me when people say, well, I don't think you should do all this processing. I think you should just take what comes out of the camera. You actually have to work really hard with the DSLR. You usually have to write your own software to get to the actual raw data. And the raw data coming off of the sensor in a DSLR is actually pretty hideous, just like it is off of a DSLR. When you bring it into 
uh, Photoshop or Adobe Raw or Canon Professional, they they know they know ahead of time what the the balance is between the color channels. They know all about how that camera is made, and there's some work that gets done to that image to give you a nice uh, presentation. And then when you go to edit it, you know you just sharpness and you change some you change some things around, and it's really not a great deal of work to to edit a raw file out of a DSLR because some of the work is already already been done for you. When you use a DSLR for deep sky work, usually we use specialized software that pulls that low level data out. And a lot of people are like, well, the data looks terrible. And I'm like, well, you can't really judge based on that. If you're doing nightscapes, you can go ahead and use the normal, uh, you know, the normal workflow, lots of very high quality commercial software by people who know a lot about imaging. Uh, and you can, uh, you can use that to, to great effect. Okay, so that, and the reason I went on on that is because it's a very common misunderstanding that I run into uh, all the time, people going back and forth new to DSLRs or new to uh, deep space coming from DSLRs. They don't, they don't know those differences. So the next thing, um, there'll be letters about this, uh, but uh, white balance is fake. Um, it, it's, so here's the, here's the thing, white balance, uh, the raw data, the raw file, the raw image that you get is encoded in the raw file. And then there's a flag or a variable in that raw file that says this was shot with, right, with white balance for sunlight, or this is shot with white balance for a cloudy day. Uh, or if you took a, um, a custom picture with a gray card to do custom white balance, it'll store that information. And what that's storing is the ratios between red and green and blue. But that white balance isn't actually applied to the raw data on the camera. It is applied to the raw data when you bring it into your post-processing software. Um, wait a minute. You, you are shooting raw, right? Because when you shoot JPEG, I'm completely wrong, all right? When you shoot JPEG, the white balance does get baked into it which is why you should always shoot raw because you can always change the white balance after the fact because it's not really baked into the image like it is uh, with a JPEG uh, file. And this is really great because you can change the color tone of your uh, nightscapes. Uh, you can change the color tone. You, God help you if you're trying to do deep, really deep sky stuff with the, with the telescope with JPEG. That's just not going to work and I don't have time to explain all of why, but you really should be shooting raw Anyway, but white balance is not completely fake. Obviously, it's a real thing, uh, but it doesn't get baked into the data on the on the raw file the way people think it does. It's something that you can apply and change afterwards, and it's it's a lossless modification uh, to your uh, to your raw data. Now, the last one, I definitely will get some letters about this. ISO is also fake. Um, obviously, it's not fake. It does something, but but a lot of people misunderstand what it really is. Number one, ISO does not make your camera more sensitive to light. Uh, your image sensor is as sensitive as it's going to be and you can't pump extra electricity into it to make it more sensitive. Uh, you could cool the chip and you get less thermal noise. Uh, so you get a, a, a cleaner image and because it's cleaner, you might be able to detect things that were lost to the noise before but you're not really increasing the sensitivity. The raw sensitivity of the sensor, you know, sometimes it's 50%, half of the light falling on the sensor gets turned into a digital number that can be read out or maybe 70% of the light. And the, changing the ISO does not change that uh, a bit. What ISO does is it allows you to shoot JPEG uh, so that you get a bright image the way you need it to appear. So when it pops out of the camera, the image is almost what you want. And it also allows you when you're shooting raw to get your initial raw image to be close to where you want it to be so that you can do less processing on it. Um, now there's some, there's some subtleties to ISO. We're gonna, we're gonna get to that. I'm sure then the comments section, somebody's going, what about ISO invariant? We're gonna get there, hang, just hang on. We're, we're gonna get there. First though, when, when I talk about ISO and what kind of noise it is and what kind of noise it's not, uh, I need, you need to understand the sources of noise. And we're not, we're not, this is not gonna be a lecture on noise. I just wanna quickly tell you about the different types of noise. So you know there are more than one source of noise uh, in your image. And we're really only gonna zero in on one of those sources of noise. 
and we'll briefly talk about um, read noise as well. Read noise is the electronic noise, just the fact that when you read the data off of the image sensor, uh, there's, some, there's some bouncing around of the signal, so to speak. Sometimes the count goes up a little bit, sometimes the count goes down a little bit, and you get a little bit of noise for that. And that read noise is, it's usually very small. It's usually completely negligible when you're doing daytime photography. You don't see portrait studio photographers or wedding photographers or sports photographers worrying about read noise. You got so much signal, even on a, even on a, at a sports field at night, you have so much signal compared to the read noise that it's not even worth uh, discussing. But with low light astrophotography, very often very faint features that you're trying to capture might be mixed in with the read noise. And one of the, one of the challenges is to expose so that the signal that you are interested in is at least up and out of the read noise so that you can, uh, you can find it. Probably the most important and yet most misunderstood forms of noise is called shot noise. And shot noise is due to the random scattering of light falling on your sensor. Uh, imagine photons falling from the sky onto your, into your camera lens. It's like rain falling on the sidewalk. And if there's just a little bit of rain, you just get a few little splitches, uh, splotches of, of water here and there. You get a good downpour, you get a good soaking, the sidewalk is completely covered with water. Well, to get a good image, to get a good clean uh, noise-free image, you need enough photons to completely cover that sensor and you get a nice uh, pretty image. If you just are shooting something very dim, the photons, I mean, literally you might get, you know, three or four photons a minute uh, for some very, very faint uh, target. And if you don't expose long enough, you can't, you can't see it because there's not enough signal built up against, uh, against the background. We also have pattern noise, uh, which I have some, I'm going to show you some examples of how ISO can help with pattern noise, um, which is one of the nice things uh, about it on many cameras. Uh, usually we calibrate this out with a dark or a bias. Uh, we also have dark current noise, which is random noise added because of the heat in the camera. Uh, also contrary to um, uh, some uh, popular belief, you can't subtract out dark current noise by subtracting a dark. Uh, darks are going to get rid of your pattern noise and your hot pixels, but they're not, they're not actually getting rid of dark current noise. The only way to do that, well, we won't go into that. Um, the other is uh, noise from your uh, PRNU, photo response non-uniformity. That's the Jeopardy $800 category quite, uh, you know, definition there. And that's tiny variations from pixel to pixel. And that type of noise we calibrate out with flat fields. Um, and this is really more important for uh, deep space stuff with a telescope than it is for nightscapes. Most of the time with nightscapes, and I know it drives a lot of engineers crazy, it does me too. Sometimes because you can measure a difference doesn't necessarily mean that it's an important difference. Um, and a lot of times with nightscapes, you can just use lens correction and things like that and get rid of the vignetting. And the, the PR in you is really, uh, it's not going to be noticed in my big, you know, Milky Way going across, uh, going across the bay. Uh, so for, for most of the time, we can, we can let that go unless we're doing uh, you know, deep sky work with a, with a telescope, but we're not going to go off uh, too far down that tangent anyway. The two most important are read noise and shot noise. And uh, the read noise usually looks, you know, kind of like this, just a, a, a mild, uh, a mild speckling there. And this is a globular cluster. I just put that up there because it's a very noisy image to show uh, what, what noise looks like. You know, noise is important too, because this image has less noise, but you can see more of the stars in the image, I should probably move my mouse over here. You can see more of the stars in this image than you can in this image. So controlling noise is important in astrophotography for getting, uh, getting the things that we, that we wanna look at. Okay, so back to shot noise, all right? This is, and this is why most people don't understand ISO because, we're, well, hang on, we're gonna get there. Shot noise is really, it's just random holes in your signal. There's photons raining down on your camera and you can see there's barely kind of a galaxy here. And that's because if with a very, very short exposure, not a lot of the light from that galaxy has been collected yet. And you just can't make a good picture of a galaxy if you haven't collected the photons. They're not there. You can't amplify photons that aren't there, they, that they don't exist. 
uh, not against that background noise. And, and yes, I'm glossing over it a little bit, but, but you get the idea. Now, here's the thing. The longer you expose, the more signal you get. And one of the counterintuitive things is the noise actually also goes up. So the longer you expose, the more signal you get and the more noise you get. They're both going up at the same time. The nice thing is they don't go up at the same rate. Here's a graph showing uh, the relationship. And the signal here is going up you know, more or less linearly. That's a nice thing about uh, image sensors over film is if you expose twice as long, you usually get twice as much signal. And here, the noise is going up much slower. The exact mathematical uh, formula is the noise is the square root uh, of the signal. And that's the only math I'm going to give you today. Well, you might have to divide by two in a minute. Uh, but that's the only hard math I'm going to give you today, is the signal goes up, the noise goes up with the square root. Now, what happens if the signal is very low down here is the, the noise is higher than the signal. And you can't, you, you can't see what you're shooting at all around here the signal starts to eke out above the noise. That's kind of what this looks like. The signal's just barely higher than the noise and I can sort of make out what's there. But as the signal goes up, the signal to noise ratio uh, gets higher and higher and you get a cleaner and cleaner image. Technically, it's not correct to say that you beat down the noise. It's actually what you're doing is you're increasing the signal to noise uh, ratio. Another common misunderstanding about this is people try to turn these numbers down here into the number of sub-exposures or how many minutes that you expose. This has nothing to do with how many minutes you expose. This has nothing to do with how long you expose. It has only to do with the amount of signal. Now, obviously the signal goes up with the number of exposures and the signal goes up with the longer you expose. But this graph, you can't look at this graph and go, well, it doesn't make any difference after 16 exposures, for example. No, it doesn't make any difference after the signal gets high enough that you can't tell. Even in a single frame, here's a, a, a picture of the horse said nebula and the frame flame. And right here in the flame area, we've got some very bright areas. And we're going to have a very high signal to noise ratio here. And we'll have a nice smooth background here because it's very bright. But the horse head is a big, you know, dusty smokestack in outer space, so to speak. And that's dark. And I'm going to have a lot more noise inside this horse head than I am out here. So if I want a smooth horse head, I'm going to have to expose a lot longer than I need to just to get a good smooth background back here. This is one of the reasons I don't like online formulas. You have to... It's, it's, like, it's like cookies from the grocery store. You get the tube and you cut them up and you put them in the oven. And that's great. You did a lot of work. The cookies are delicious, but you're not, you're not a chef. You're not, you know, you're not an expert bake. It's not time to open a bakery because you can, you can make bake cookies like that. And photography is the same way. The formulas get you started. They give you a sense of accomplishment and look, you got a nice picture, but at a certain point, you wanna take your photography to the next level. You're gonna to have to start evaluating your data on the fly and go, you know, I thought two minutes was long enough. Maybe I need to go a little longer. Or I thought two hours was long enough and I can see that I need to go a lot longer in order to achieve my goals uh, with, this, uh, with this image. Anyhow, back to signal to noise and, and why we care. So here's, I, I made sort of a fake uh, animation. I just go from frame to frame. Here's, we get a little bit of light and a minute later, I'm kind of making the numbers up, but you know, you, a little bit later, the longer you expose, the more light from that galaxy gets to my camera and the more light to the galaxy gets on the camera, the higher my signal to noise ratio goes. So I'm going to get to the point where I have a very nice clean image of the galaxy because I've got enough signal from that galaxy falling on my sensor. And that's because shot noise. Shot noise is just simply holes in the image because all the photons haven't been, have not arrived yet. We did not collect enough light to make a smooth image. This is physics. It's not my opinion. It's not a rule of thumb. This is the physics of light. This is how it works. You have to get enough light to get a clean image always. Okay, so how do I get more signal then? Uh, obviously expose longer. If you expose for two minutes instead of one minute, you're going to get twice as much light on your sensor and you're going to get a cleaner image. Um, uh, the other way is to, is to increase the aperture. So, you know, photographers know how to adjust the, the aperture on their, on their camera lenses and, you know, f 
the 2.8 is a nice big hole and F10 is a little tiny hole. And the little tiny hole doesn't let a lot of light through. And you're going to get a noisier image uh, at night if you don't let a lot of light get to your sensor. The other way people try to get more light is increasing the ISO. And that is no, no. Increasing the ISO does not, does not increase uh, the sensitivity of your sensor for the 500 zillionth time. Now, way back in the day when we used film, chemical films, we had ISO and we had, we had ASA and all sorts of things going back forever. And those chemical films literally were more sensitive. We've got a lot of rules in photography. We have the exposure triangle. We have ISO and aperture and exposure time. And all of those rules work great with the digital camera because the digital cameras are simulating that sensitivity of the film to give you the brightness in your unprocessed image that you're after. And this is invaluable for most forms of photography. So no, ISO is not entirely fake, but you need to understand what it's actually doing that it's not making your sensor uh, more sensitive. Let me give you a real world example. Um, several years back, I, I, it was time to, I upgrade my camera every year, uh, not every year, every so often I'll upgrade my, my DSLR. So my current camera, 5D Mark III. And I remember when I got it, it had really great low noise. And I bought a used uh, Canon 200 millimeter F2.8 uh, prime focus lens. All right, I've got a really nice new camera. I got a really nice new lens. I'm going to Disney World. So I went to Disney World. I live outside Orlando. So I, I go to Disney World and I get on the, you know, the Pirates of the Caribbean and the, the Haunted Mansion. And I'm going to take some pictures in these low light things. Because if you've ever tried to take a picture on one of these rides, you know, with your phone, it's just this blurry horrible mess. Well, now I've got a professional setup, right? And so I go and I get this, I get this shot of, um, this is a fortune teller in a, in a, in a, in a crystal ball. And, um, and I, and I got that with my lens and it, it looks, it looks great. So I thought it would simulate, I would, I would use this as an example. Now I know it was a shot at F2.8. I do not remember. And I couldn't find the raw for this because it was several years back. Um, but let's let's make up the numbers for the point of illustration here. Uh, let's say I was at f2.8 and it was 1 60th uh, of a second and it was at uh, it was at ISO 3200. Okay, so there I got a nice image ISO 3200 1 60th of a second f2.8. Uh, Most people when they try to com compare uh, the noise from ISO, they'll change the ISO and then they look at the image. But here's the thing, that doesn't, that doesn't work. When you increase the ISO, you have to hold the exposure time and the aperture constant. So let's say I took an F4 lens with me on this trip. So it's one stop from F2.8, half as much light with an F4 uh, lens. And I'm trying to take that picture on a moving ride and it's blurry. So what do you do? Everybody who's been to a photography class knows I need that 1 60th of a second so that it's not blurry. So I change the ISO. I can't open up my lens any wider than F4 because it's an F4 lens. So I up the ISO from 3200 to 6400. And now I can get the shot. And in 1 60th of a second, I got just as bright of an image by upping the ISO. Uh, and look, it's noisy. All right. So class, here's your pop quiz. Why is that image noisy? Simon, can you tell me? Hate to put you on the spot. Why, Why is, is that it... shot more noisy than the other one? Yeah, yeah. Now I did simulate it, but why is it noisy? Is it noisy because I upped the ISO? Yes, you did up the ISO because you, you mentioned you went from 32 to 6400 ISO. I, I did. I did. What else did I mention? That was I'm putting you on the spot. I'm sorry. I know. All right, so the first image was at f2.8. The bottom image was at f4. So yes, I upped the ISO in order to brighten the image, but I have half as much light. And that's why the image is noisy. It's because I have half as much light showing up uh, on my sensor. And so it's actually, we can actually do the math. It's 41% uh, increase in noise uh, because we had half as much light um, falling on it. And you don't have to believe me, you can do this experiment yourself. Uh, in fact, it's what really, this is one of the really cool counterintuitive things. With most cameras, increasing the ISO actually reduces the noise. Um, you, and, and fine, don't believe me, try it yourself. Go out somewhere dark 
and set your camera up at the sky and, and take a 10 second exposure at a certain F ratio and change the ISO. Take a 100, a 200, a 400, an 800, but keep the aperture the same, keep the exposure time the same. You have exactly the same amount of light falling on your sensor. The only thing that's different is the ISO. And look here, the ISO 100 image actually looks terrible. And the ISO 800 image is very, is very clean. And we have a nice progression from the higher the ISO, the less noise, the less noise we see uh, in our image. And that is because, all right, we got the same amount of light. So what's happening is down here around ISO 100, we have, um, it, you know, it happens for a, a, number, of, a number of reasons. Uh, the read noise is down here, but this is not read noise. We see these patterns. There's all these color lines and gunk, and we see these streaks through the image. That's pattern noise. Uh, in fact, if you do a long exposure um, uh, noise reduction, it, it'll do a dark inside the camera. You'll actually end up still with a noisier image uh, for reasons I won't get into, but it will get rid of these streaks uh, to a large degree and, and make them uh, make them a good, uh, a good good a good bit better. Now this is with most older cameras uh, will will behave this way. My 5D Mark III uh, works like this. In fact, I did this with my 5D Mark III. And um, some of the newer cam some of the current cameras will do it. A lot of the newer cameras don't, which we're going to get to in a minute. Uh, but I would say most cameras in circulation, which is most cameras that people have, because a lot of people are shooting with older Rebels or older cameras. Everybody doesn't buy a new camera as soon as a new camera comes out. And so you may have one of these older cameras. And if you want to get the best nightscape uh, performance, you should do this experiment. Do it in your house in a dark room or take it out into the sky and do it. And you may find that you get cleaner nightscape images by increasing the ISO rather than, you know, a rule of thumb, lower ISO, less noise, right? Usually in daytime photography, that's because lower ISO um, collects more light. It's less sensitive, it exposes longer, and you collect more light. And when you collect more light, you get a higher signal to noise ratio. Okay, now, and this is, this is a, this is, well, yeah, well, we'll get there. All right, so why am I going on and on about this? Because this is very important. Um, when you're, when you're doing astrophotography, we have an enormous uh, dynamic range that we're trying to capture, and usually with very, very little light. So how to get this noise down to begin with before we start processing and trying to get the noise out of our image is very, very, uh, is very, very important. Okay, so enough of the foundations, right? Let's talk about the cameras. And the reason that I wanted to go on about uh, the ISO and this experiment where most people's cameras um, will do this, where the noise actually goes down as you increase the ISO. I wanted to show you, I did the same experiment with the EOS R and, um, and the RA. And it doesn't, it, it's not the same. Uh, this is called ISO invariant. I'm sure there's some people who are dying to put in the comments, what about ISO invariant? Okay, yes. So now we have the newer Canon cameras are ISO invariant. So you can see here, uh, 100 to th uh, 3200, there's very little difference. You can see a little difference uh, between the 100 and the 200, but that 100, the extra noise is a random noise. This looks more like read noise than it does pattern noise. So Canon has done some stuff. So the pattern noise isn't showing up at low ISOs with very low, uh, very low levels of light. And that's really, really important for, uh, for astrophotography. In fact, for me, you know, the new camera comes out, I look at my camera, I spend a lot of money on my camera, and it usually takes some convincing of myself and my spouse, even though it's, you know, I can make it a tax deduction, it's, the money doesn't count, grow on trees. So do I, is it really time to upgrade? And uh, up until now, I've never, I've never wanted to upgrade my, my 5D. But the, the, this by itself to me is the killer feature. Before we talk about anything else, I really think that this is like the most important thing about the EOS R uh, and the RA, and they both behave this way uh, identically. Uh, once you get to about ISO 200, you can literally shoot at any ISO you want and then just stretch the image in Photoshop or Adobe RAW or, or something later on uh, to get the, the brightness you want. The advantage you get from shooting at the lower ISOs is you get more dynamic range. So you can actually expose a little bit longer before the stars start to saturate. Uh, things that saturate lose their color. 
So if you want to maintain the color in your images, you don't want to saturate. So you can expose longer to get the fainter areas without necessarily uh, oversaturating some of the brighter areas. And I can't do that with, uh, with my 5D very well, but you can do that with an R, um, even with an R, even without the RA, you can, you can get that, um, you can get that, um, that benefit. Now this, this is a, a, a qualitative analysis here. It's not quantitative. I'm sure somebody's gonna do noise analysis and there's gonna be a chart and they'll show the, the percentage of noise going down. But very clearly, from a from a qualitative standpoint, I can see that uh, you know the the noise difference between ISO 200 and ISO 3200 is, you know, for most for most intents and purposes, uh, is is going to be is good, is going to be negligible. And okay, so let me look at my notes. Do I feel? Do I remember anything? So this is all weird stuff. I, I should say, if you're a daylight photographer, this is sort of weird stuff, and it it doesn't matter. Uh, too much for for daytime photography. Uh, just keep using ISO the way you've always been using ISO. It's a you know it's a it's a very important part of the you know the exposure pyramid or the exposure triangle I should say uh, to to get things you know closer and closer. I really like to get close to what I want when it, what comes out of the camera. I want to be as close to what I actually want as possible, so I don't have to spend you know an hour uh, trying to get the noise and you know try to get things the way that I want them to be. So the RA, the R's, um, I should say, uh, they're not, <coughs> excuse me, uh, they're mirrorless. So the camera, the sensor actually has a, it doesn't have a shutter, but it shifts the pixels so that you don't need a shutter uh, for the sensor. But the, ca the, the cameras aren't entirely shutterless. And I really like this. Uh, I really uh, am very annoyed by astronomical CCD or astronomical CMOS cameras that don't have a shutter because, well, we don't need a shutter. Uh, but a shutter is still very, very nice to have. Now on these cameras, it's utility only. Uh, you don't have to, it, this shutter doesn't affect how fast you can expose based on it, uh, but it does keep your sensor clean. When you pop the, when you pop the lens off, I know that I can cover up my lens first uh, because I know I'm not getting dust on my sensor by keeping it open. And if, if you've, use DSLRs for very long at all, you know, you know that, that dance you do where you take the, the lens off and now you've got two items you don't want dust to get into and you've got to cover them both up as quickly as possible. Um, so at least uh, with this, your, uh, your sensor is going to be uh, nice and clean. It does open up when you use it. It clicks after the image. And this is really, this really bothered me, at, you know, as a newbie to the mirrorless world, uh, first time I'm taking uh, photos on a tripod and uh, I press the button and nothing happens. And I'm like, is it, what, what's going on? And then click, and I'm like, oh, did it just start? No, it had just finished. So when you start an image, it doesn't click when you take the image, it clicks at the end of the image when it closes it, uh, so which is it's kind of a, just a new thing you have, to, you have to get used to. This is really great when you put your camera on a telescope because if you put on the back of like a refractor, or a closed, uh, you know, a closed system scope like a Schmidt or something. Uh, it's a closed environment, and your sensor is hanging out there, but it's it's all sealed up, you know, more or less. But let's say you're on a Newtonian, and it's all open, and so when your camera is on the telescope all day and it's covered up, all sorts of things can float around in there and get inside your camera. So I really like having a sensor. This is just another nice thing for an astrophotography DSLR is having the shutter that kind of closes and keeps that chamber from uh, things crawling out of it. I, I live in Florida. Trust me, things want to crawl inside anything you leave outside, and they don't care how much it costs or how nice it looks. Uh, they will crawl in there and try to make babies all over it, and it's just, it's just cleaning bug guts out of things is not, uh, is, is not fun. Speaking of shooting with the telescope, uh, you know, the EF, uh, the, the new camera, uh, it has a bigger opening and uh, it, they change lenses. Now there's su supposedly going to be some really great new lens designs because it opens up some extra uh, degrees of freedom uh, for designing lenses. Uh, but it, if there's an adapter so you can put your old lenses on it because when I, when I, when I, you know, it's one thing to buy a new camera. It's another thing to buy your entire new lens collection. Most of us have collected our lenses over years and every few years we change cameras and it's kind of nice to keep the lenses. You can still do that with an EOS R. You have this little adapter here, 
that uh, goes on there and then your, uh, your regular Canon lenses plug onto that. The nice thing about that is it works seamlessly with your T adapter on your telescope uh, as well. And the spacing is right. I have over a dozen telescopes that I shoot with and I do not want to have to buy a dozen different spacers uh, to get it right. Anything that I've got that works with my Canon DSLR is going to work fine uh, with the R or the RA uh, as long as I have this adapter, which I'm going to want anyway because I do not want to get rid of some of my very nice uh, prime Canon lenses, to, uh, at, at least not overnight. I'm also very happy, and I think it's worth mentioning that USB tether still works. Uh, if Canon is watching this, I just, I like, please keep USB tether. There's a strong uh, thing going forward where cameras should be Wi-Fi and you can control them with your phone, you can control them with your camera, and that's great for consumer applications, but it just stinks for astrophotography. Uh, we have a very complex orchestrated dance that goes on in the night between running the telescope and running the focuser and running filter wheels perhaps and running the cameras, and we need to be able to take pictures and download them and do stuff and then move the telescope, and it's really nice to have all that integrated together. And Wi-Fi just really stinks for that. Plus, I've been on the field at the Texas Star Party where I turn on my Wi-Fi and there's 87 different Wi-Fi hotspots around me. And there's just not enough bandwidth uh, or enough room in the, you know, in the airwaves for that many hotspots. And so it doesn't work or it works intermittently or it works fine until you go to sleep or it works fine until you take that long walk to get a hot chocolate and then it all goes haywire. So I really like that um, Canon has not said, hey, the world's gone Wi-Fi, we're going to go Wi-Fi. There's still a USB tether. And just as a developer and as a, as a, as a photographer who uses this all, stuff all the time in an automated fashion, please keep that. Don't get rid of my USB tether uh, option. Uh, the vastly improved noise performance. Uh, so the noise, you know, the noise control is, is uh, very good. And that's going to come in real handy on deep sky targets, uh, especially. And um, Let's see. Uh, ah, so the open box. So um, I, my most expensive astrograph, I, I remember when I bought it, it was like it covers a full frame chip. And I'm like, oh, I've got my new Canon 5D. I want it. And it was F3. It was that Afachina thing you saw a few slides ago. I'm like, this is going to be great on my full frame DSLR. The problem was uh, that F3 light cone was very, uh, very, very shallow coming in. And I got shadows from the mirror box and I got a big long band at the bottom and flats just wouldn't calibrate it out. Flats will help calibrate, you know, slight vignetting or uh, dust bunnies and things like that. But if you've got a deep shadow, you can't calibrate out it. You can't add, you know, you can't just make it brighter and get that signal back and get a nice uh, clean image. And I ended up, you know, for all intents and purposes, I might as well have been sh shooting with the crop sensor on that astrograph, um, even though I had a full frame chip. Well, on, on the R's, uh, Canon's opened that up quite a bit. It's much wider, there's no mirror box at all. And so there's much less stuff in there uh, that can get in your way uh, when, you're, when your light's coming in. So this is really also, it's a really better camera for fast optical systems. Uh, so if you're trying to shoot at, at f3 or maybe f2 on a Rasa or something, that light cone coming in, you're gonna get a much uh, much less uh, shadowing from all the stuff uh, inside the camera body. Uh, so yeah, the, the electronic viewfinder with preview is also uh, pretty nice. I'm going to talk more about the preview uh, in a minute. There's some pretty nice things uh, there. Uh, but a lot of times I like to shoot just full disk moon images sometimes while I'm waiting for it to get dark. And uh, you know, just use your telescope as a thousand millimeter uh, telephoto lens. And uh, it works. Uh, it works great for that. So you can use that to, to get a preview of what the uh, image is going to look like. Okay. So nightscapes. Let's talk about shooting nightscapes um, with the R series. Uh, first, there's no more mirror lock. Um, sometimes uh, not everybody agrees with me, but I prefer using mirror lock. I like to pop the mirror lock, the mirror up and out of the way first before I take an exposure. You can get the same effect by using live view, but live view heats up the sensor and I don't like the sensor to get really hot. And people are like, it doesn't matter, a little jolt at the beginning of the exposure. You don't want your telescope or your, your tripod getting bumped at any point during the exposure. Why is at the beginning of the exposure not any worse than in the middle of the exposure? Uh, so I always use mirror lock and I, and I, did, I did see a, a difference, especially on my moon shots 
um, when I had mirror lock on, I got consistently uh, more usable images where nothing was was vibrating. Well, mirror lock is gone. And sometimes, honestly, mirror lock is a real pain in the neck because you got to click and then click. And so it, that's completely gone. It just kind of streamlines the whole uh, imaging process. Also, Live View actually works at night. Uh, this image here, this is the Milky Way. Uh, can you see my mouse, Simon? Yes, okay. So that's the Milky Way. You can look through uh, the viewfinder on these or use the LCD on the back. I just held my iPhone up and took a picture of the back of the, of the viewfinder and you can really see the Milky Way. Even with this fast f1.4 lens on my 5D, I can't see the Milky Way um, on, my, on my live view. Uh, but you can on the R series. And I think it, it's because of the noise control. The way they do the exposure simulation has to benefit uh, from the way they're handling the noise uh, versus the way they used to handle the noise. And that's really very cool. I remember, I remember you know, the first time I experienced this, it was like, you got to be kidding me. This is like... It's like having night vision, uh, you know, looking looking through the camera. I, I could have just walked around in the dark with it, uh, and, and and saw so much better, uh, which is which is really cool. Uh, focus assist. So here, are these little two triangles pointing at each other. Uh, as you move the as you move the manual focus back and forth, uh, this one would open up and it would it would be white, and then when they close together, it would turn green. And, um, you know, focus assist, I've never experienced focus assist working on a star field before, uh, but it does. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, again, a really nice feature. I found that if I switch back and did manual, which we'll talk about in a minute with the RA, I could sometimes get just a little bit more sharpness out of it. But this is, this is actually um, quite sufficient for nightscapes. You get a nice, beautiful image and it's, you know, it's, it's going to go on your laptop screen or Facebook or something as long as you're not trying to blow it up to, uh, to be on the side of a, a bus or something, uh, it's, it's going to work great for, um, at, at, for nightscapes, I should say. I'm sure it's perfect for daylight stuff, but at night, you know, it's, a, you know, it's, a little, it's a little more tricky. Another really cool thing, and I thought this was an RA feature, but it's actually an R feature, is um, there's, a, there's a timer mode for bulb now. And it doesn't have a full built-in intervalometer, which would be nice, Canon, hint, hint. Uh, but I can actually set my bulb up uh, to do up to 100 hours. Um, it's actually not 100 hours. It's 99 hours, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds, which is one second short of an hour, but close enough. Uh, but you can set the bulb timer up at, for, for anything you want. So if this is really great because if you're on a sky tracker and you don't have a super fast lens, you might need to go more than 30 seconds, which is the usual limit for when you're shooting in manual. Uh, so you can set the bulb mode up to do a minute or two minutes or whatever you need, and you can just fire them off. Let's say you don't have an intervalometer or you're not uh, shooting remotely. Uh, they do have Wi-Fi and they do support remote shooting, and that has its place. Um, but you, if you don't have that available, you can set the bulb up uh, to do uh, much longer exposure, which is uh, pretty nice. Uh, you know, one of the nice things about an intervalometer and this is if you're using Wi-Fi, your Wi-Fi device has to stay you know, charged and active the whole time and connected. So this, again, just sort of lowers the, lowers the burden on what kind of equipment you have to bring with you uh, when, you're, when you're hiking in the dark somewhere. Okay, so I'm sold. I'm ready. I'm ready to upgrade. I finally, I, this camera, the R, is good enough for nightscapes. Uh, I mean, uh, is, is so much better for nightscapes than what I've been using. Uh, lots of these features are, are really great and important for anybody trying to do astrophotography. Um, and, and, that's, and that's great and all. So what happened is uh, the, the software I work on for Software BIS controls Canon cameras and the new R series comes out and our customers start buying them and our software doesn't work with them. Uh, the, the raw format has changed. There's something about the timing. I can't even get it to take a picture. Some of them will take a picture, some of them it won't. So obviously I need to fix this. It's probably very simple, but you can't fix these kinds of problems without having a camera uh, on hand. So Canon uh, done a great job. I'll give them kudos for this. Their developer relations has really uh, flourished in the last few years. 
So Canon's developer people said, okay, yeah, you, you actually make real software. People buy it. We'll send you a camera for a couple of weeks. And they sent me an EOS R and it only took me like half an hour to fix the problem. Well, I'm a photographer and I have the camera for a few weeks. So what am I going to do? Send it back and go, I'm done. No, I'm going to use it and take some pictures with it. Uh, so the winter star party was coming up and I thought, oh, you know, I really need to exercise it on the telescope. And, uh, and my, you know, an unmodified camera is great for clusters. It's great for reflection. I should have shot, I could have shot the Pleiades uh, or a number of targets with it. But I'm like, ooh, there's a lot of nice emission objects. And I think I would rather use, um, you know, a modified camera. And so I rented the RA initially. Uh, I got it from um, one of the lens rental places online. They also rent uh, cameras. And they had one available for the week of uh, Winter Star Party with very little notice. And so I said, okay, send me the RA. And oh, this will be cool. I'll take the R and the RA both down to the Winter Star Party and I'll shoot with both of them. And I can, I can like do some comparisons uh, between the two because I'm sure, um, you know, I was hopeful that the RA was going to be uh, much, much better. But also, you know, I like to do birding and things. So I like to go around during the daytime and shoot birds. And I would, you know, I was thinking I would use the, um, use the R for that. Um, ironically, it was a very short-lived uh, comparison. Uh, it didn't take very long at all. And I just quit using the EOS R at all. I just, I just used the RA for everything. Uh, the RA has two really important features that, that the R doesn't have. And then a third thing that I find very important that they did not take away. And um, I'll get to that in a second. So what do we get with the RA? Well, the, the, the easy, kind of the cheesiest thing they added, so to speak, that not cheesy, but just like the easiest thing they added uh, for astrophotographers is they increased the zoom on the back to 30X. So if you really want tight, tight stars and the best uh, contract, you've got to be spot on with focus. And it's very difficult to focus uh, manually on a star field. Uh, usually things are, are shaking around. And so what we do is we zoom in as much as we can on the back and we turn the focus ring to the stars as small as possible. And there's usually a range where the star doesn't appear to get any smaller, but uh, when you're at the key focused area, a bunch of other little faint stars will suddenly pop in and you know that's it. Now I'm as sharp as I can be because I've got all the stars in the field. Well, now you can zoom in, uh, you can only zoom in 10 times. Now you can zoom in 30 times which is in crazy amount of, of zoom. The stars, even when they're nice and focused, they're, they're big and you can really tell uh, a lot easier when you're at the sweet spot uh, for focus. Trying to, I've, done, I've helped friends do workshops at the Grand Canyon and, and things and trying to teach people that that's, watch for the other stars to show up is a little, it, it takes some practice uh, to, to do. Well, with this, you can really tell a lot easier. And I think, uh, I think that's a, a much nicer, um, I don't want to say um, idiot proof, but it just it makes it makes the process a lot simpler uh, to get to get things nice and focused. Now, the big ticket item <clears throat> that everybody talks about is the increased uh, sensitivity to hydrogen uh, emissions. So emission objects, nebula, uh, have glowing hydrogen gas uh, that is red. Uh, I, I've, I've heard some people say, well, you can't see it anyway, why capture it with the camera? Actually, that's not true. Hydrogen alpha is absolutely visible to the, to the naked eye, you know, assuming it's bright enough. That wavelength, most people can detect it. And it's a nice thing to capture then uh, in, in your images. I mean, after all, we're making an image of something you can't see. Why argue about, you know, anyway, we won't go down that, that route. Um, so in nightscape images, here I've got a side-by-side. -side. I, took, I took a nightscape image uh, just to the Milky Way out over the, over the bay in the Keys. And this is the Lagoon Nebula uh, right here in the Milky Way. And here's the Lagoon Nebula over here. This is with the RA and this is with the R. And so you can see that there's a little bit better. And actually this area here where these nice rich star fields are, I like, I think a little more red came out there and that was a nice, just a little richer color there. Now I'm going to admit, a lot of people are going to look at this and go, yeah, I'm not sure that's worth 400 extra bucks. I mean, uh, my Milky Way is going to have some little red dots in it. Uh, some of us, though, are going to go, you know, every little detail counts. And, I, and, I, and if I can pick out those uh, nebula in the Milky Way, I think that adds a lot to the picture. And I'll leave that up to you as to whether that's worth it or not. Now, if you're... Um, 
if you're shooting deep sky with a telescope, though, uh, the difference is actually huge. Oh, this is a mistake. I changed my slide. That's 30x, not 15x. So pretend you don't see that. It doesn't say that says 30. Um, here's a 30 second exposure of the Horsehead Nebula through the telescope I was showing you a minute ago. And the one on the top is uh, with the R, and the one on the bottom is with the RA. And uh, the, the sensitivity to the hydrogen alpha is three times uh, greater with the RA than it is uh, with the R. Now, up here at the top, you can sort of see this area, see this triangle here at the bottom, very red. And up here, it's there. And you might make the argument that if you take enough exposures, uh, that this red will show up here. And then you could selectively adjust the colors and make that red really stand out. But then you, I would say you've missed the point of my earlier part of the, the, the webinar. It's not just that this shows up better, there's more signal there, which means it's less noisy. So not only have I detected something better, but I'm gonna get a cleaner, uh, less noisy uh, sub exposure. And um, that's actually pretty nice. Only 30 seconds exposure, that's at F7. And this is uh, the result of an hour and 15 minutes uh, of these 30 second exposures. So there's a lot of exposures, 30 seconds each. Um, but you know, I, I couldn't do this on my, I've got a modified DSLR a little bit, a few years older than my 5D even. Couldn't do this uh, with that. I would have to have a lot, I would have to have it like three times uh, more data with this. So if you, if you wanna use your DSLR for deep sky astrophotography, you're gonna get more signal uh, with less noise. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's pretty nice. I, I'm, I'm very impressed with this. This is not, this is not, well, Richard's been doing this for 20 years. I'm sure he's a whiz at Pixinsight. Uh, Richard doesn't like to spend more than half an hour processing his, his images. Uh, so I did not spend my entire weekend trying to make this image look this way. I did not use some fancy plugins to reduce the noise. I, I did use, uh, you know, PixInsight, and then I bring it into Photoshop. And I don't like to do a lot of work. My mantra has always been start with good data. Um, if you have good data outside, it's very easy to bring it in and you do a few tweaks and you're done. With astrophotography, the few tweaks usually end up being a half an hour or so. But you don't want to spend... Uh, hours and hours and hours uh, processing the data to get uh, to get a good uh, to get a good result. The third really kind of key killer feature for the RA for me is the lack of any difference for daytime photos. Um, this is why I just quit using the R uh, completely. Um, I've used the uh, the 60DA. I've used one of the competing competing uh, you know modified cameras. Uh, I have a couple of, uh, you know, hand modified cameras. I didn't modify them. I'm terrible with hardware. Uh, and I've never been able to take a photo uh, it, during the daytime with a modified camera that I didn't have to at least back off of the red a little bit. And I'm just like, yeah, you can tell that's a modified camera. So this, these images, I spent like maybe 10 seconds on each of these images uh, when I brought them in from RAW. And I did not have to do a custom white balance and I did not have to uh, I did not have to, to, to change anything. They did not look reddish. They didn't have a reddish haze or, or anything like that. And I, again, I'm not a professional photographer. I, I don't do wedding photos and landscapes uh, for money and I'm not on the front of National Geographic, uh, but I, I find this camera is 100% suitable for daytime photography. Uh, it's just as suitable for daytime photography as the US uh, R was. So if you wanna do astrophotography, and daytime photography, uh, just get yourself an RA uh, instead of um, an RA and an hour, so to speak. All right, and I think I've talked for about an hour. Questions, Q &A flames? Indeed. Oh my God, Q and A. Um, oh my. I don't even know where to begin because- Don't shoot make, JPEG. Without, <laughs> Without saying any swear words, you've caused quite a storm. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. So right. uh, I'm going to try and start from the top and work my way down, knowing full well people are going to start 
uh, pouring more questions in through the door because oh dear i have to go i'm very sorry <laughs> <laughs> i mean i'm uh I, I was actually on text message with um somebody who's watching the stream he's actually a good friend of mine uh, his name's mac murdoch uh, if you haven't checked out any of his stuff i'm sure he'll post his instagram link in the live chat cough cough and i'm going to get to his question later but let's just make a start on some of these so do the new mirrorless cameras have a filter in front of the chip that blocks the hydrogen alpha? Well, the new mirrorless cameras are exactly the same as the old uh, mirrored, uh, mirrored cameras in that they have a filter in front and it blocks the, they wanna block the infrared. The infrared light, uh, the, the sensors are very sensitive to infrared and the infrared light usually isn't as focused as the other light and so you wanna get rid of it. The problem is those filters uh, are too aggressive. Not only do they, do they um, block the infrared light, but they also block some of the hydrogen alpha light, which nobody noticed or nobody cared uh, when they're doing regular daytime photography. And even for nightscapes, you, you can make the argument that you can't really tell that, um, you know, the, there's a little, this is a little bit extra pink here where the, where the uh, lagoon nebula is. And so, um, what people started to do is removing that filter and putting a new one in that also blocked the infrared, but let the hydrogen alpha wavelength come through. And then they could get more vivid nightscapes and they could do uh, get much better photos of emission objects. On a galaxy, it's not gonna hardly make much difference, uh, but on emission objects, it makes, it makes a really big difference. Uh, and so Canon at some point said, hey, why don't we ship a camera with a modified filter that you know, that works for that. And then people don't have to, you know, when I bought my 5D Mark II, $3,000 for a camera, the first thing I did was void the warranty by sending it to uh, Hap Griffith, who, you know, opened it up and, you know, put the new, the, a new filter in it. Um, so, you know, we'll sell the camera. And so they came out with the 20D and a few years later, they came out with the 60DA. Uh, and uh, there's still, you know, quite the, you know, the boutique market for, uh, modified DSLRs. A couple of people still do it professionally. You can buy you can buy them that way. I think um, Butec uh, sells them uh, mm -hmm. pre modified. Yep. Uh, and now we have we have the EOS RA, and so they use a different filter, and um, you get the full Canon warranty, and you know the you don't have to worry about uh, sometimes the focus would shift when you when you replace that filter so that you couldn't come to focus with a uh, with your lenses anymore without having to manual focus all the time. So it's really nice to get a nice commercial package that's just all ready to go uh, and is sensitive to those extra uh, wavelengths. And I think until now, I've, I've never been satisfied with using a modified camera during the day uh, like I am with the RA. And again, I'm not a professional photographer. So if we get into an argument, I, I, may, I may have to go, oh, I, didn't, I didn't know about that. I don't mind admitting that I'm wrong. I, I, it means I learned something and I'm smarter tomorrow than I was today. There we go. Uh, but we'll see. So, yep. So uh, this is actually a really good question because I, I get this uh, quite a lot. Um, when you say pattern noise, do you mean banding that you get with the older cameras? And this is actually a known issue with Canon cameras. Uh, actually, no. Um, the banding, uh, the banding that I'm aware of is, um, is electronic, is electronic noise. And I don't think I've seen that in any newer Canon cameras in, in a while. I did, I did see that in some older, uh, cameras. Uh, but what I'm talking about is if you shoot a bias frame with the CCD, um, or, or with a Canon, it's a very dark image and you'll see a pattern and that pattern is actually from the chip itself you'll get rows and columns that are slightly less or slightly more sensitive to light, or they have uh, in CCDs, they might have a trap leap and you get a, you get a column that's a little extra uh, bright. Also, also hot pixels are a part of uh, pattern noise uh, as well. So no, the banding is a separate, is a separate thing. And I'm not, if you're buying a new camera, I, I've not experienced banding with my Canon DSLRs in, in recent years. Now, way back in the Rebel, you know, the original Rebel days, yeah, 15 years ago, um, I would see that, but not lately. All right, so here comes the barrage of um, parts that I think was getting heated here. So ISO on a DSLR camera is equivalent to gain on a CMOS one-shot color camera. 
how do the numbers relate to each other? Is ISO 200 equivalent to 12-bit depth? And what gain value is equivalent? No. Um, ISO is not equivalent to gain. Uh, I get into a very long discussion with uh, a colleague of mine who is, uh, is an expert. Um, but you cannot equate ISO to gain. Uh, ISO is a simulation. And sometimes uh, they use gain, uh, a chip gain. Some, they're, they're, you can apply gain on the chip. You can apply gain off the chip. There are different stages in the, in the camera pipeline where gain, different types of gain can be applied. Sometimes gain is nothing more than they just multiply the number. And you get no benefit from that at all. Uh, you can do that in, in Photoshop, uh, where you just, you just make the image brighter. And so um, it, from camera to camera, where do they apply sensor gain? Where do they apply gain after it comes off the sensor? Varies. So you cannot, you cannot assume that ISO and gain are uh, the same thing. And I remember uh, the conversation where it was going around and around with somebody that I know is smarter than me. And I know he knows more about uh, camera electronics than me. But at the end, he said, so ISO 100 is the lowest gain that you're using. And I'm like, no, ISO is meant, you're, they're dampening the image uh, to make it match what ISO 100 film used to do. And he said, well, I don't care about any of that. And I'm like, no, but that's the whole point. We're not talking about CCD cameras. We're talking about DSLRs. And ISO... Um, it's similar to gain in many ways, but it is not the same thing as gain. It is physically, electronically, something different than gain. And often gain is, is a part of it, but where gain is applied, you don't know. Um, and if, they, if the camera vendor does it poorly, uh, you'll get less or better noise results. And you know, all I can do is reverse engineer uh, the cameras because Canon's not gonna tell us you know, exactly how they're doing it. Uh, internally. There are some people who will do some quantitative tests uh, to measure noise, and they can get fairly close to that. But the uh, I suspect that on this camera, uh, there's some gain kicking in between ISO 100 and 200. And then after that, they don't do they don't do any kind of electronic gain. Because if you're careful, with, if you apply the gain correctly, the gain can uh, get your signal up above the read noise, which in very low light situations, uh, can give you a benefit. And I I, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm guessing uh, that Canon is just applying just enough gain to get above the read noise at the bottom of the ISO range. And from there forward, it's pretty much uh, ISO invariant. So it depends on if it's a Canon or a Nikon or a Sony or an Olympus. And it depends on whether it was made last year or three years ago or four years ago. Um, and for all I know, Canon may have brand new cameras that still work like my 5D, uh, where the higher ISO is going to give me less noise. The only way to know is to test your camera. Uh, take it out somewhere dark. Uh, take a series of exposures where the aperture and the exposure time are identical. And the only thing that changes is the ISO. You have to do that in manual mode. Then bring it into Photoshop, uh, like uh, a raw processing program, and adjust the, the stop, the exposure, by the right number of stops uh, to get the equivalent brightness. And you can look at those images side by side, and you go, well, that looks like that's really noisy, and this looks beautiful. And so obviously, if I increase my ISO a little bit, I actually get the same brightness when I, when I brighten it in, in my tools, but I don't get any extra noise. And I actually got more noise by shooting at a lower ISO. And it depends on the camera. I know there's some cameras where you can't tell the difference at all between 100 and 128,000. Uh, to me, that's a marketing gimmick. A camera that goes up to 128,000 is, is entire. It's nice when you're looking at the view screen on the back because you need to be able to see you know, what you're going to get. But when it comes time to post-process, I might crank the ISO way up to do a preview, and then I'll turn the ISO down uh, to something reasonable so I don't have, you know, destroy my dynamic range uh, when I start to process the data later. So hopefully I, I that think was I, an adequate... I, I really want to dispel something here because ever since the advent of digital cameras, I have never been a fan of the reference to ISO or ASA specifically. When I buy film as in a roll of 35 millimeter film or 120 film, it's measured in ASA 100, 200, 400 and so forth up. The reference here is the physical size of the grain increases. Hence why if you've got an ISO 50 film, it's a very fine grain is what they refer to it as. But when you see 3200 film, the grain 
it's not because you're seeing more noise, it's because the grain is bigger, is because you're capable of seeing the noise. And I kind of find, I don't, I've never liked how they've translated ASA uh, and ISO film into the DSLR market, because in my head, it never made any sense because the pixel size on your camera don't get bigger. They're fixed to one size. So I, I do not have as much experience with film uh, as you do. I did shoot, um, I, basically I stole my wife's SLR at some point. Um, and I remember, you know, the, if I was going to the circus and it was gonna be dark, I would get the, you know, the 3200 film instead of the 400 film. If I'm out in the daytime in the park, I would get the 200 or the 400 film. So yes, the grains were larger, uh, but was it not true that the larger grains were, were more sensitive to light than the smaller grains were? Yeah, the larger the grain, the more sensitive it became. Okay, so it did, it did have a correspondence to the sensitivity of the film. Oh, but totally. It also, but the graininess wasn't, it wasn't shot noise, it was the grain from the film, the, the physical medium in which it was captured. No, right. But I mean, that, that was a thing I just never enjoyed. I never liked that translation into digital because with digital to me, it, it's always been about math. And again, we're back to that argument. ISO, is it the same as gain, so forth and so on. To me, ISO is an algorithm that is created by each individual cam camera manufacturer to emulate that film look. Right. I think people like formulas and they just want to look up something on the web, but the only way to get the best results from your camera is to take it out in the dark and characterize it. That's, that's the only way to do it. That's the only way to do it. It only takes 15 minutes. And, so and, yeah, I'm going to go into this question because uh, I know otherwise we just, we're, we're repeating ourselves through lack of better description. <laughs> this is the text conversation I was having backwards and forwards with a friend of mine. Um, and I, I know the answer to this to a certain degree, but he, he wants clarification. Um, okay, let's say for example's sake that I have two shots, both with the same histogram taken at the same time in the same conditions of the same object. One is ISO 400, but a five minute exposure, and the next would be a uh, 6400 ISO, but only 30 seconds. Would you say that the ISO 6400 won't have more noise? I'm going to say, uh... Physically, I don't care what the ISO is, mm -hmm. the, the longer exposure is going to have less noise, less shot noise. This is, right. this is physics. This is just physics. Now, if the camera somehow makes the shorter exposure look cleaner, the camera is doing something to the data. But I know from a physics standpoint that more light equals less, uh, less relative shot noise. And, and that's, that's, just, that's just physics. It's like you know, arguing against Newton or something. Um, it, that's just the way it is. So uh, I would say uh, longer, ex the, it, and, and I make that trade off in, in the field. It's like, okay, it looks okay on the back of the thing. The stars aren't moving. Uh, as long as the stars aren't trailing and I can go eight seconds instead of six seconds, I'll drop the ISO and go eight seconds because I know I'm getting more signal in eight seconds than I am in six seconds. And I'm gonna get a cleaner, I'm gonna get a cleaner image. Um, this is a, another message coming in from text message. <laughs> a lot of people are texting me at the moment, so they Don't they, they give your number kill. out, Simon. <laughs> yeah, I know. They want to kill me at this point. Um, and uh, actually, this is actually a great question. The graph that you showed earlier on, uh, can we shuffle back to it real fast? The graph that you showed with the uh, horse head. Because uh, this, this will demonstrate... Uh, something very, very good here, because again, I know the answer to this, but keep going. That, that that's one, the okay, graph, it? that's it, that's okay. the one. So somebody is asking here is the signal to noise ratio, at what point does it become dimin diminishing returns? In other words, is there a ceiling to actually exposing for too long to the point where the signal and the noise is, is essentially matched again? So in general, they say, um, you know, I've read many times, a signal to noise ratio of at least 10 to one means uh, a good, you know, a good quality image. The thing is, you can't turn that into, uh, well, then no more than 10 exposures, because 10 exposures is not going to give you a signal to noise ratio of, of 10 to one. 
over your whole image. One of the reasons I chose this image is it has dark areas and it has uh, bright areas in it. And if you're shooting, uh, when I shoot the, the say the Orion, uh, no, let's say when I'm shooting the, um, the Andromeda galaxy with the Veloce, all right, I've got an F3 object, uh, an F3 optic, and I shoot the Andromeda galaxy and I take uh, a two minute exposure. If I take a single two minute exposure and I stretch it, the core and those little, uh, uh, those little uh, kind of brown areas where the, the fingers are coming through, it's mm -hmm. so silky clean. How many exposures did I need? One. If I go out away from the core where it was darker and I get into those arms and I get into those areas where the blue stars are, it gets real noisy. So what am I interested in? Am I interested in the core? One exposure, I got a nice clean image. I want stuff out at the edge. I need to do more exposures. And this is why I don't like telling people formulas. It's like, it's, it's, not, it's not easy bake you know, cookies. Uh, if you want a beautiful image of the Andromeda galaxy, you have to look at your data and you have to go, there's some interesting stuff out here at the edge where it's very dark. And I can see there's an extra dark lane there starting to pop out and I have to, I have to go longer. Uh, when you first start off, when I first started, in astrophotography, I think I did the same thing everybody else did, which was I've got a clear night. How many images can I get? And uh, I, you know, the next day I post on Facebook, um, and and I don't accept friend requests from people I don't meet, I don't know. So don't don't do it. Anybody watching this, don't don't bother. But you know, my friends who are watching this, go back ten or fifteen years and look at my astro photos, and those were the nights where it was like I got four galaxies tonight. It, you know, so it's so great. And they're hideous by you know by by what I can, by today's standards they're they're just hideous because I was trying to get lots of them. Later on, you're like, okay, so right now I'm in love with uh, you know for the first part of the night this is what I want, and the second part of the night this is what I want because they're available, and uh, I'll shoot them for a couple of nights, and I'll look at the data every every morning, and I'll go, oh, I've got enough on this now. Um, and then I'll go, no, I need a lot more data on this. And I have a couple of objects where I really wanted to get enough data and then it's, they're too low. And maybe next year I can get some more data and I can combine with it. And that's the difference between, you know, cranking out, you know, 10 astro photos every month and trying to turn out, you know, some really, some really good ones. And, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to discourage anybody, but, um, you know, basically look at your data. Is it clean? process it, post it, be happy with it. Is it really noisy? You need to expose longer. Well, how long do I need to expose? Well, it depends on your optic and your focal ratio and the sensitivity of your camera and how bright the football field is uh, a mile from your house. There are so many variables. And uh, I, just, I just have to say, I trust myself more than I trust, um, uh, than I trust the formulas. One of the few places where I trust formulas is when I look at the back of the image, on a DSLR, like when I'm doing daytime photography, I can't, sometimes out in the sun, I can't really tell if I've exposed well or not. And I always turn on the histogram display. And so the histogram is one of those things where I trust the numbers. But when it comes to really low light stuff, you're not gonna get much of a histogram anyway, uh, not in your single exposures. And so you're shooting this and I wanna zoom in on the horse head. This is a very dark area. area. I'm gonna need much more I'm going to need much more exposure time on this head than I am for this background. This background is going to be smooth first night, but there's a lot of noise in here and I want to smooth in. There's a little, there's a little star hanging off his nose and there's these little tendrils of, of light. And I want, I want that to come out really well. Well, I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to do more exposures. Same thing. I think the the Andromeda galaxy is a really good test case because the core is so bright that usually only need like one exposure of the core. And then the further away you get from the core out on those arms, the noisier and the noisier it gets. So what's the formula for the Andromeda galaxy? Well, do you, it depends on your field of view. Can you capture the whole galaxy? Can you get those little tendrils way out at the edge? They're very faint. You're going to need a lot more time uh, to capture that. It, it join, join the photography club, uh, the local photography club, and walk in there and say, so I want to shoot birds. What, what F ratio and ISO should I use for birds? And, and no, don't, I don't want to understand any of the details. Just tell me what ISO and, and, and exposure time I need for birds. 
And they're just going to look at you and shake your head. And we go, dude, it, it depends. You know, what bird, how far away is it? What's the sun look like on the outside? You have to learn. You have to learn to do this. Um, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's a hobby. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. Anyway, I, I could talk forever. And right, yeah, we could, I know we I'm can. Gonna, I'm going to get myself this is one in trouble. Subjects, yeah. I mean, yeah. Craig's, Craig Stark um, actually explained it brilliantly with uh, the case of diminishing returns. There is a point where there is no more data that you can physically collect because you have essentially had nothing but signal. And all you're doing is trying to like just move noise around in circles. Um, but I mean, going back to what his initial question would be, if it was one single exposure, it, and you've hit the nail on the head with the Andromedan galaxy, is what part do you want to see? Do you want to see this part or do you want to see that part? Right. And I, I would turn around and say, there is no true ceiling um, for diminishing returns when it comes to one single long exposure. Because the longer you're exposed for, the more you will start to see. But it also can mean that you'll start getting unwanted signal it is, is the big problem. There, there's always there's always dark areas, and it's amazing when you go really deep on an object. Uh, there have been times where I've been working on some other project, I'm doing programming stuff. I remember I was working on a new focusing algorithm. I just shot, you know, the same object every night for a week. I shot the same object and just had this stupid amount of data on it. And I was like, well, I should go ahead and stack it all and process it. And when the noise is that low. When you, you can stretch and stretch and things will come out that you've never seen uh, before uh, in the noise. And then if you apply, you know, I, I like to, I like to just very tiny little bit of sharpening. I don't want to, I don't like to over sharpen tiny little bit of sharpening, but if you don't have any noise, the tiny little bit of sharpening brings out things that, oh, look at that little tendril there. That's pretty cool. Um, so I'm kind of like you, I don't believe, I believe the limit is when your patience runs out. Um, for how deep you should go and just evaluate the data. You know, you, you can, you can run through the data every couple of nights and go, okay, this is, this is good. And you get a feel for it. All right. With this camera and this optic on a typical galaxy, I only need, you know, three hours and it's going to look beautiful um, until you go to a dark sky site. And then the, the equation changes a little bit. So this is a weird switching of gears here. Um, earlier on, there was a really interesting question for me, at least, is how do you figure out the field of view on a DSLR? Because it's not like an eyepiece. It's not like uh, you throw a 30 in there and it's 86 degree field of view, well, not 82 degree field of view, or you throw something else like a, a 14. How do you figure out the field of view with your DSLR camera or your camera in general on whatever scope? Oh, uh, well, now a word from our sponsor. Uh, I use the Sky Professional, so it has a field of view uh, calculator. So I just put I put my camera in. Uh, it's usually already in there. Uh, so there's a there's a math uh, equation. I don't have a slide for it, and I don't remember it off the top of my head. But if you know the size of the chip and you know the focal length, uh, you can determine uh, the, you know the field of view, how many degrees of sky or arc minutes and seconds. Uh, does this encompass? And it works with camera lenses too. And I and I use it all the time. Uh, in fact, I use um, I use the sky on my iPad, uh, you know, for that very purpose. I just sit there and uh, I say, okay, this camera and this lens, this lens. And I'll have them overlaid, and I'll have, you know, before a star party, uh, I'm making my imaging list. I'm like, okay, so this camera and this lens, or this camera and this telescope, uh, frames up uh, this this target pretty pretty nicely. Um, so that's that's what I do, and, and most most astronomy charting software will will have a field of view uh, tool in it where you put in the telescope, and even if if they don't have the telescope, all it needs is the the focal length of the telescope and the the size of the sensor uh, in your camera, and it can show you a little overlay over the sky and tell you exactly uh, what's going to fall on your chip, and uh, you can go from there. It's really cool because you can use this is why I like the crop sensor changing the focal length kind of grates me because. I can put a small sensor on a thousand millimeter focal length telescope and a big sensor on a 400 millimeter telescope. And it's the same image. You know, it's basically the same field of view. And it's like one's 400 millimeter focal length and one is a thousand millimeter focal length. It's like, it's the same image. So it's like, you know, the, the size of the sensor, the field of view, it, it you know, it, anyway, 
enough of that. Let's not start. Yeah, no, that's that otherwise. is a whole different topic of conversation. All, but what, what was the name of the software though? What was the name of the software? The Sky Professional. The Sky there we Professional. Go. Yeah, from Software Biz. Yeah. Uh, who do you want for again? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, next question. How are two faint stars filling one pixel with light registered? Will the sensor show one star? If not, what is the solution? Smaller pixel size question mark. Oh, so. This is to do with resol resolving. That's that's what this yeah, is about. Smaller. Sm well, it's a it's it's not just the pixels. So. The size of the pixels, obviously, if you if you have two stars next to each other, you have to have enough pixels uh, to to capture the two stars and separate them. Uh, but also, your optics may not be able to separate uh, those two stars. So it depends on how close they are uh, to each other and whether your optics can can resolve uh, the difference between those two stars. The key thing, without getting into a physics lesson that I'm frankly not qualified to teach. Uh, but I do know the key thing with that is the aperture of the telescope. Uh, so the resolving power actually goes up with aperture. This is another reason why with telescopes, the, how big a round it is, is more important than the focal length. Because a, a larger aperture gives you greater resolving power. Uh, the, you know, the great planetary imagers like, say, I don't know, like Christopher Goh, for example, um, you know, they use, they use really big Schmidt Cassegrains of, you know, 12, 14 uh, inch and why, uh, I was watching yesterday and Simon asked about, well, what's the difference between that and a, and a refractor? And I've done some lunar work with my refractor and it does, it does a great job with a six inch refractor, but boy, when I use my 12 inch Newtonian, yeah, uh, what a difference. Yeah. What a difference. And yeah, it's a brighter image, but you also get more detail. Uh, because it, the resolving power uh, is 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 better. So what you need to do is you need to figure out what the pixel scale is for your camera and your telescope. Don't ever buy a camera from anybody who doesn't say, well, what kind of telescope do you have? Or what kinds of objects do you want to take pictures of? Um, and you're going to get a number like so many arc seconds per pixel. And generally, uh, if you live in an area with good seeing where the atmosphere is uh, not bubbling around too much, uh, you can shoot around an arc second per pixel or so. A lot of places out west uh, near the mountains, it's going to be a couple of arc seconds per pixel. It's all you're going to be able to resolve uh, because of the atmosphere. If you're up on a mountain, um, then you, you're going to go down a little below an arc second uh, per pixel. Uh, I have a really good, there's a couple of good write-ups on my um, Imaging Foundations blog and Sky and Telescope. Go back, it's one of the earlier topics that I talked about is uh, pixel scale and resolution and, and oversampling and undersampling and, uh, and understanding those things. Um, this is a, uh, an interesting question in the, in the sense that I'm not 100% sure if you're going to know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Uh, why camera makers don't make a color, a color Bayer matrix with two reds, like red, blue, green, red, instead of two greens? I already know the answer to this, by the way. So the, I believe the answer, an educated guess, I think I've read this, is because the green is usually, um, we're more sensitive to green. The green is the peak of the human visual uh, acuity. And so you, you actually have to construct, you know, the full color image from the Bayer matrix. What you get is three different images, a red image, a green image, and a blue image with holes in it. And so you have to fill it in to make a full resolution color image. And that green gives you a lot more signal uh, to work with. And, you know, you're taking a picture of what we see and the green, you know, that's, that's what we're most sensitive to. How did I do yeah. Simon? Do you, do you have? Yeah, no, I mean, essentially the reason why we have this existing Bayer matrix in regular DSLR cameras or in any camera in general, should I say, is it's designed specifically to emulate what the human eye sees, which is why the green pixels are the more common of the two sets. Now, that being said, um, is it possible to obtain uh, cameras that do have different matrices? And the answer is actually yes. In fact, you will find them in security cameras. Um, if you notice that there are some color security cameras out there, and these tend to be the cheapy ones that you might buy from some, you know, random store like Best Buy, their sensitivity is actually greater in red because they genuinely have red, well, it's red, blue, red, 
blue, green, red pixels. And everything shows pink. If I'm wearing black pants, I look like I'm pink. And mm -hmm. they also have that red infrared light mm -hmm. that they shine onto everything, which is also what makes everything visible. But well, the problem with that here is if I had that in my camera, I'd be taking pictures and be going, well, that's not what my eye sees. It looks like I have color blindness mm -hmm. almost. Mm -hmm. So that's why they're not actually all that popular. Does it show up in astronomy cameras? The answer is actually, yes, they do. You just have to find which camera supports the changing of the Bayer matrix. Um, QHY ZWO have a couple of variants in their color cameras and unfortunately they no longer sell the 174 color, uh, which is a bit of an upset. But what they did is they changed the, um, where the pattern is red from. It's like shifted down one pixel, which then gives you red, red, green, blue, uh, which is actually yeah. really, really useful. The only problem is they don't make that camera anymore. The yeah. 174 or the IMX 174 Sony chip was actually used very extensively for security cameras because of the larger pixels. Yeah. They also make uh, make Bayer matrices where there's a clear one. So you get luminance yeah. RGB because the, the Bayer matrix, you know, if you have a mono camera with a filter in front of it, as much as 99% of the light gets through that filter, but the Bayer matrix blocks a lot more than that. And so if you have a Bayer matrix where some pixels are left to luminance, you get a much higher signal and they can use that to boost uh, the, the red, green, and the, the saturation of the red, green, and blue and get a better, a better signal. There's also some cameras where they use, is it CYMK? The, they mm -hmm. use magenta and, and, and cyan. Um, and I, I tried one of those, I didn't like it much. But, um, yeah, they're not very common because they, they, they would tend to, they were made originally for um, scanning of photos and things like that. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not very popular. Um, this is actually a question in this, but I've had this asked for me uh, quite frequently. So there's a couple of companies that sell, and I'm not going to say who they are because they're not actually available to the public. So I'm not actually allowed to mention who makes the camera, but they make infrared digital cameras. Do using an IR camera, so to speak, is it beneficial to use something like that for astrophotography? Yes, yes. So I have a, I have a modified T3i uh, Rebel and it's full spectrum. And I use um, an IR pass on that uh, during the day. It's really fun to take infrared photos uh, during the day. I also have another uh, couple other infrared passes uh, that I use with uh, CCD cameras uh, as well. And I actually, I did an experiment. I need to, I need to write this up for uh, one of my blogs or something where I shot with a, a, a monochrome camera with luminance, IR and HA on the moon. And I took like 8,000 frames and how many of those 8,000 were sharp enough to use with the luminance and how many were sharp enough to use with HA. Because I noticed with the HA and sulfur too, that I got uh, more sharp, uh, a sharper image. And so that high wavelength is much less affected by uh, turbulence uh, in the atmosphere. So when you shoot with infrared, uh, like on the moon, uh, you'll get uh, you'll get less turbulence. You still get some turbulence, but you'll get uh, much more usable uh, subframes when you're doing uh, lucky imaging. Also, on some deep space objects, um, I have not done it. A friend of mine, uh, Kevin Lagore, has shot uh, some some really dusty objects with an infrared pass, and you can see stars behind the dust that you can't see uh, with uh, visible light. Uh, one year at the Texas Star Party, it was completely overcast, and we had a, a, a camera with a wide field lens on it, and we put an infrared pass on it, and we actually did a T-point run with the Paramount uh, under a cloudy sky because there were stars coming through the that you could see stars through the clouds. And I'm not I'm sure if it was big thick thunderheads, it wouldn't work, but it was completely opaque to the human eye. But there were just it was just a frame full of stars when we shot uh, when we shot the star uh, sky with that infrared. Uh, pass. Now you have to be careful. Not all sensors are very sensitive at the infrared uh, wavelengths. Uh, some of them are more so than others. So when you look at that uh, graph with the sensitivity, make sure there's still, um, you know, some some headroom out at the infrared uh, wavelengths when you when you do that. Um, this is a, um, a question specifically about the setup side of things, and I've I've had a situation before where I've had weird results. Okay. Is it better to use 
the battery or the AC adapter with the RA? I have not used the RA enough to say for sure, uh, but I do know that a discharging battery releases heat. And so um, for nightscapes, I always use a, a, a battery because it's the easiest thing to do. Whenever I hook it up to a telescope, I always use um, an adapter. And what I did was I bought, um, I bought Canon's, oh, uh, here, Canon will love this. I bought a cheap knockoff uh, adapter and it lasted about three weeks. And um, it actually, the plastic got brittle and it shorted out and I, I could have toasted my camera. So do not buy cheap knockoffs. I bought a real genuine Canon AC adapter that plugs in and I, and I cut it. And uh, uh, I had a friend who's better at electronics than me make a, an AC, uh, a power adapter. So my mount, 12 volts is easy to come by, but I don't want to send 12 volts into my camera. And it would tur it turned 12 volts into 8.2 or whatever it was that the camera wanted. And I always run power in that way. I always power my camera externally when I'm doing long exposures on a telescope because I'm exposing all night long, um, you know, hours and hours of exposure with that camera uh, with the battery inside, uh, you know, generating heat. So, uh, you know, is it, is it, is it negligible? That's sweetened to taste. It depends on, you know, if you live in a cold climate in Florida, good Lord, I live in Florida people. It's like 95 degrees and sweat is dripping off my nose at two in the morning. Uh, I don't need anything extra uh, producing heat. And if you live in Alaska and it's usually 40 degrees when you're in and you think using a battery is fine, you know, have at it. Uh, but I always, I always power my bat, I always power my camera externally for, uh, for deep sky work and the battery is fine for, for nightscapes. Excellent. All right. So last chance to get uh, your questions in because we're coming close to our time. Um, I'm going to ask you my own questions now. Um, using the RA, do you feel that it, it's become a game changer in, in the world of astrophotography? I mean, I know you mentioned that, you know, if you had to have one camera, but, you know, it would have been that particular camera. But do you have, do you feel that it's become a game changer? Um, oh, geez. So... You know, what, if I knew enough about marketing to say for sure, I'd, I'd probably be a millionaire by now. You know, I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I can just say from my experience, um, I usually sit on a camera for a while. Uh, same thing, you know, with smartphones. I don't buy a new one every year. It's like, what's, what's really compelling about this that's going to make me upgrade? And um, I, I never wanted a 60DA because I love doing photography and... Um, it's like, it's, it's nice, but I really like having a full frame camera. And, you know, in the early days, uh, when I, when I had my first rebel, uh, I think it was a T1i when I got that modified, you know, I'd puff out my chest and go, you know, you just shoot raw anyway. When you bring it into raw, you can fix that red thing. And, but the truth is after you've done that for 786 times, you get kind of tired of it. And it's just like, I'd like to just bring it in and it'll look kind of like what I want it to do. So I can do two clicks and save and be done with it. And um, with the RA, I can do that. And uh, so I've never, I've never considered a, an astro camera to be equivalent to a daytime camera until the RA came out. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied. It's, um, it, I'm ready to upgrade. The, the ISO invariance is also a really, um, is a really big deal. Uh, I, I don't shoot with a DSLR on a telescope as much as I used to. And I think I'm gonna try it a lot more now. Um, you know, the cooling is an important thing, in the, especially in the summertime in Florida. Um, but it, it sure is nice uh, not to have a whole lot of stuff that you have to wire together sometimes. So the DSLR really is very, uh, it's a very convenient camera to use for deep sky sometimes. I think and a lot biggest, of times, like, yeah. I was going to say, I think the biggest feature on the uh, RA is definitely that, three, that 30X. I mean, to me... Mm -hmm. That was the big game changer. I mean, it was like for the first time I can actually zoom in because I wasn't too sure or whatever the case may be, but that's 30 mm -hmm. times you can actually nail it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I practiced enough at the 10X that I can see those other stars pop in. Um, but what I found is it's really hard to teach. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, the 30X, the 30, there's no question the 30X makes that a lot easier. And if you don't have good focus, you're not going to get a very good image. Uh, I've come home 
you stay up all night. You had to get up at three in the morning. The whole rest of the day is ruined because you were up all night. And, you know, you're not very productive. But by God, I got these great images. And then you look at them and they're all out of focus. And you're just, yeah. You know, what, what did I do that? Why did I do that? Um, so it, it is a nice, it is a nice feature. Uh, for me, it's a nice feature. The, the ISO invariance and the red sensitivity to me are like overwhelmingly, those are the, those are the really big ticket items that uh, make the camera more appealing to me. I think the, the weight of the RA plays a huge importance over this too. I mean, I've seen yeah. like with the, uh, people using like a 5D Mark IV. That thing weighs a ton by comparison. Yeah, I have the 5D Mark III, and it's it's much lighter. The four, when I got the R, uh, I took it to the zoo, and um, yeah, I hardly felt like I was carrying a camera around compared to my my other camera. I'm like this is a really light camera. So yeah, you can tell. You can tell. All right. So this is a good question as well. Uh, do you recommend using multi-band narrow pass filters? In other words, dual band filters or tri-band on uh, the RA? Oh, uh, I haven't tried them uh, on the RA. I have tried them with uh, other color cameras. They work great on, uh, they do work really well on emission targets. Uh, they really don't do anything for galaxies. Uh, and for giggles, I shot, you know, like I tried shooting in 31 with one of these just to see if it would, you know, well, you know, we might see. No, it's just terrible. Um, use a, a light pollution uh, filter uh, for most targets. And only if you're shooting an emission target uh, should you should you use those uh, those types of filters. It, well, some of the filters, I mean, I've tried countless filters, to be honest, mm -hmm. um, and this is not a plug. This is a genuine thing. I've used the Astronomics. I've used the Optolong one. And I was given a set of the uh, IDAS filters from Hutech. And out of all of those filters, I think the Hutech ones to me have performed the best for that type of photography and, and they have all different types of uh, filters one specifically designed for light pollution uh, sodium vapor white light or led light should i say mm -hmm. and then they actually have their dual band filters that does ha o uh, o2 uh sorry o3 uh ha s2 etc etc and uh, I think what it is, it's you have to use the right filter in the right situation. You should, in exactly. other words, if you're in a dark sky, you don't need a filter. Don't don't right. just put it on there thinking miracles are going to occur because at the mm -hmm. end of the day, with a filter, you still lose half a stop. It doesn't matter how you mm -hmm. cut that. And in some cases, you can lose as much as two stops. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Bruce Bronstein is asking, hello, Bruce, uh, oh, hi, is Bruce. asking any tips for adding Atlas Comet into the sky. And I don't mean physically, I meant the software. Oh, uh, input solar system bodies. It'll go out on the internet and download it. Make sure you have a newer version of the sky. If you have an old version, uh, it doesn't understand HTTPS and it can't get the orbital elements. But uh, yeah, that's all you have to do uh, is uh, bring up the comets tab, you click on observable and it downloads them all. And then find C slash 2019 space Y4, and then it, that's enough, and it'll pop up Atlas, and you should be good to go. Uh, Bob Massey. Hello, Bob. He's Hi, Bob. Probably, he's hiding in Riverside somewhere. Um, I can sure use a latte, Bob. <laughs> yeah, we all know who Bob is. Um, my Starbucks buddy, yeah. 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 Uh, there appears to be two EF lens adapters, one with, one without the control ring. Do you have the one with the control control ring and what does that give you on the adapter oh so okay so uh, a feature of the new lenses is they have another ring that you can twist so you know you've got focus well there's another ring and you can program that to like change your iso or change your uh, f-stop uh, without having to go back to the buttons uh, on the camera so the, the, the adapter I have does not have that. Apparently that's an attempt to give people with the older lenses that same flexibility that they can use the control ring. Uh, I don't have that. Um, you don't need it if you're putting it on a telescope. And frankly, for me, I, I mean, it's a nice, I, it, it might be a nice thing if I did a lot of daytime photography and I needed to change the, um, the aperture or something. But I, you know, when you have a, a one of the reasons, 
you, one of the reasons when I got the R, I had a lot of trouble with it was because uh, I was used to my 5D. You get a camera, you get used to using it in the dark. You know where all the buttons are and you don't have to think about it. And then you get a new camera and they moved all the buttons around. And uh, so give yourself like at least a week to get used to where the new buttons are. Um, but yeah, the control ring, ask me in a year and I might go, oh, it's so nice. But right now I'm like, yeah, okay. It, it just, yeah, I, I suppose a lot of, that'd be nice for a lot of people if there was something they changed frequently. Um, but you know, there's there's this pre-programmed settings on the camera. So I like put it to C1 for nightscapes and C2 for this. And uh, I find that's adequate at the time being, but anyway, I've gone way above and beyond what that question was about. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, maybe you should come work for us and sell cameras. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys and girls. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to post them. Um, we can definitely try and forward them over to Richard, assuming that he has time to go through them, of course. Um, oh, one just slid in. Uh, can you run T-points with the RA? Oh, that's a good question. That is actually a yes. good question. Can you run yes. our T-points? Yes, uh, you can run T-point uh, with the sky with any DSLR. Just uh, bin. Uh, the DSLRs don't actually have hardware binning, but it, uh, when you bend the DSLR, it combines uh, the Bayer matrix and gives you a luminance uh, equivalent image, more or less, it's pseudo luminance. Uh, but bend two by two when you're using any DSLR and the RA is, is just like any other in that regard. And you can play solve and do T point and, and everything. Uh, in fact, when you focus, if you do autofocus, uh, you should bend two on a on a DSLR. That Bayer matrix is sort of an artificial sharpness uh, because of the holes in it. So bend two by two when you're focusing or doing any kind of plate solving uh, operation. You get better oh, results. Um, I did miss a question. I thought I missed one. Uh, hot pixels. How? <clears throat> excuse me. How bad are the hot pixels on the camera? I mean, I don't think uh, your camera is old enough to have developed any major hot pixels. Not really. Um, and that's one of those things like uh, the, the long exposure dark uh, noise reduction where they take a dark in the camera. Uh, when you do that, you actually add shot noise from the thermal current. So you remove the hot pixels, but it actually makes your background slightly noisier. Uh, so I don't ever use that, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's very subjective because there are good tools for reducing noise and there are good tools for reducing hot, for getting rid of the hot pixels. And it just depends on whether you like using a wrench or whether you like using a screwdriver. And my tools, I would, I getting rid of hot pixels in Photoshop Raw, uh, it just, when I bring it into Adobe, the, the hot pixels would go away anyway. It does a really good job of, of getting rid of that. For deep sky stuff, uh, I'm gonna shoot darks anyway, and, and that's gonna, and I'm gonna dither. Uh, so that's gonna mitigate, uh, you know, hot pixels. But um, my brand new 5D Mark III had a big red hot pixel in it when I looked at the raw data. Um, and I've not seen any hot pixels on the RA, but you know, it's a brand new camera. When I got it, the shutter count was zero. Um, so let's let it get baked by some cosmic rays for a couple of years. And, uh, we'll yeah, a couple of good develop. juicy sensor strikes on it, yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll see if we develop a few. But right now, there, there's, there, you know, it's, it's, a nice, clean, it's a nice clean image. All right, we're going to do this as the very last question because we're coming into four o'clock. Um, All right, Christopher Goh's talk is going to be slightly delayed because we've uh, we're kind of behind time. I was trying to make up time, but I couldn't. Um, your, rough, your fault with all these questions. <laughs> oh yeah, no. <laughs> well, no, actually, I I kind of knew that you were going to set off a bunch of questions on your talk. I just had that feeling. <laughs> It wasn't as bad as I, th as I thought it might be. So. No, no, it's definitely good. not. It's I mean, a lot of good. people in the chat were adding in as well and, and, and answering that. And again, they're basically reiterating what you're saying. But this is the last question. Uh, Canon says the RA lets in four times the amount of infrared, but how does that translate onto the actual image? Is it better than the R? Uh, are infrared, or you mean the HA? Um, I don't think I'm it's letting gonna, in any... Yeah, I think I'm going to turn around and say he probably meant HA because it doesn't actually let in yeah. infrared. Yeah, three to five, three to four times more signal um, is uh, equates to half the noise. Uh, so remember my uh, my graph there, and I showed you the the photo of the Horsehead Nebula with the R versus the uh, versus the RA, and the difference is is quite stark. Um, 
So I'm not sure what the question was actually now, but it was, it was, is there really a difference? Yeah, there's a difference. You can, you can see, I did, I've not measured it. So I'm speaking qualitatively, not quantitatively. Uh, but I think look, looking at it, you can, you can tell it's much brighter in the red. I think the, the big comparison would always be, and, and this is basically what this talk is essentially been about is, is it worth buying the RA or is it worth saving that few dollars and buying the R? And I think conclusively you have just turned around and said the RA is still the better buy, even if you are doing daytime photography. Is that safe to assume that? If, well, if you're not interested at all in nightscapes or astrophotography, you should just buy the R. If you are even thinking about doing astrophotography, you should just go ahead and get the RA. Um, on nightscapes, I mean, you could debate on nightscapes, you know, this image here, um, you know, it's kind of nice to see these little nebula. I can point to them. I know kind of the order. There's the, uh, you know, the lagoon. I forget what these are, but you can kind of point out some interesting areas. And in a, you know, if I'd shot this with the R, those would be the same color as anything else. And I'm not going to be able to pick them out. How much is that worth to you? Is it worth 400 bucks? Some people are going to go, yeah. Some people are going to go, no. If you're doing photography through a telescope, I mean, unless you're doing uh, variable stars or you just don't care about emission objects, no. But if you want to shoot any, any emission nebula at all, and even on, on some galaxies, most galaxies don't have a lot of HA in them, but some of them have got some nice, like M33, uh, mm, you know, that, definitely. that's got some nice uh, red uh, globs in them. And they're going to show up in an R. Uh, and they're going to be somewhat red, but they're going to be much more prominent uh, and much better defined and just more saturated uh, with the RA because it's actually going to respond to that light uh, that's actually there and you're capturing light that's actually there and that you could actually see if your pupil was the size of a football field. Uh, but it is, it is actually there and the camera is responding to that. Uh, so I, I think the, the RA is my next camera, uh, whether I got to beg, borrow, steal, or barter for it. Um, I, I was looking at what my used 5D would be worth, and it's not, not, it's not that oh, much. You know used. what to do is but, when you're ready for that, you call this number, 888-427-8766, and you really? talk to myself, really? you could talk to yeah, Farah. Yeah, yeah. Um, in your case, yeah. you can talk to Farah and bend her uh, arm a lot uh, more. Don't worry, Farah and I have already started that conversation. It's <laughs> like, yeah, this, uh, this, I'm not sending this back. <laughs> <laughs> we need right. to figure out what I got to do to make that happen. So don't worry, right, we will Simon. make it happen. So again, right. everybody, thank you very much, um, Richard, for spending okay. the, the, your time during this fantastic epidemic that we are having, or pandemic. Um, we really do appreciate you being on here and, and giving your insight in all of this. All right, um, great. Well, your fun. moment. Last words. All right. Well, uh, thanks for having me on. Remember, nobody has signed an order that says you cannot go out into your backyard and look at the sky. Um, and in fact, at the risk of getting myself into trouble, you are allowed to go outside and exercise and hike and things as long as you stay away from other people. Uh, so I have this fantastic duck pond and uh, I plan to go up there a few nights. Um, as long as you stay away from other people, uh, there shouldn't be, any, uh, shouldn't be any harm of that. So the night sky is open for business. It is not closed. So there you go. And be safe. Definitely. All right. All right, guys. Christopher Go will be on at around about 4.20, 4.30. Um, he's just having breakfast right now, believe it or not. He did just sneak <laughs> onto the chat a moment ago. So uh, we're just going to play a couple of promo videos. So here's your chance to go to the bathroom, grab some snacks, take it easy for a second. And we will be back around about 4.20 and we will go from there. So we will see you soon. <laughs>